shows that end up um, on your creek was really a braided stream. So one of the first tasks that, um, so this is what the braided, this is from the first park commissioner's report. This is an early picture of what was to become Monument Valley Park. So you can see it's very much like the streams like Sand Creek if you went out to eastern El Paso County, uh, one where it's really hard to see where the edges are. So one of the first jobs that they had to do um, and, and the, their view of what they wanted to do with the park uh, was to channelize it. So instead of this braided park that went all over the place, the braided creek, it was um, it was more chan channelized. This is um, an image from the, the plan that was done by William Le Lovett Walford um, in 1903 for the park. He was a well-known eastern uh, landscape architect, and he designed the south of the park to be a very formal, uh, have a very formal feel. And then as you went north, it became less formal. Um, he really, he was a very important um, um, architect and did a lot of things back east, which is maybe not as significant. So this is the plan from the 1909 Park Commission report um, of Monument Valley Park. And in many ways, it hasn't changed um, a great deal. The formal area is still the southern area, and this kind of the bones of that area are, are seen today. But it really has, been sadly, not, not very maintained. And Levitt, who designed the park, said that our gardens and parks should symbolize local conditions of land and light and atmosphere and color trees and shrubs and flowers and rocks, and they should also contrive to gain some of the human flavor and whatever background the district may possess from the passage of years. And I think this is significant because Palmer, as a really um, incredible naturalist, he, one of his goals for Monument Valley Park was to have one of every tree and shrub that's found in Colorado in the park so that people who moved here could see what grew here naturally. And um, hopefully plant, plant similar plants. Um, he also had an incredible um, variety of, of native um, perennials, wildflowers, in the garden. And we know that from the lists um, that they have at a Glen Erie of plants that he ordered brought from the greenhouses at Glen Erie down to be planted in Monument Valley Park. And sadly, the 1935 flood wiped out um, all of that. Um, this is another image of, of the park as it was designed um, by Lovett. And you see that um, the way it was designed, there were many, many opportunities for people in the neighborhoods to enter the park. There were many entrances, not one not one key entrance where everybody gathered or a parking lot, um, but many opportunities for people to access the park. Um, this is the earliest postcard of the park, and you still, this is right next to Boulder Crescent, still, as I said, the bones of that area are still there. This is that same postcard from 1907, so this would have been the year that the park was given to the citizens of Colorado Springs. There's a rose garden um, down there. Um, this is a house um, that was um, that Joseph, Josephine the sister of Julie Penrose um, that was built um, right on the park. And sadly, the Fine Arts Center tore that down a couple of years ago for a parking lot. One of the things I think that speaks to Palmer's um, attachment to um, his own bioregion and his own geography is all of the materials that were used in the park at pa in Palmer's time were collected on the site. So all of the walls were built with rocks from the, from the, from the creek. And it really gives a flavor of the place um, to the park. This entrance, unfortunately, uh, with the widening of um, the entrance to I-25, you now have to take steps down to, the, uh, down to this wonderful um, entrance, which I think is kind of sad. Um, Palmer had, had his own office in the park, which eventually became the caretaker's um, house um, in, in the park. And that's where Van Deest, who was the engineer who actually built the park, um, had his office. And because this was a long term, I mean, from 1901 to the gift in 1907, this was a huge project. So there were people in the park all the time. Um, this, as I said, was the earliest postcard other than that black and white one that I showed you, um, which showed you everything that was in the park had to be planted. So um, Palmer, again, is paying for all of these trees or bringing them up from the Arkansas Valley. Um, this is the formal rose garden today, and you can actually see some of the original foundation. So again, those bones of the original plan are still there. One of the things I always think that shows what people value in a community is what they put on postcards. Um, I collect postcards of old libraries because in the 19th century, libraries were fine public buildings. Today, they tend to look like Kmarts. Um, but I think it's significant that a lot of the um, Postcards from Colorado Springs from that era were of Monument Valley Park. These are just, just a few of them, and I think it shows that people valued the park. Um, this, again, is from the 1908 uh, First Park um, Commission's report, and you can see that the creek was at the same grade 
as the paths along the creek so that it was really easy if you wanted to access the water um, you could easily do that you really felt like the creek was part of the of the park um, and most of the structures in the in the park were again made of natural materials this is looking west uh, from the top of what the geologic column is right here and there was a waterfall which is right outside the picture which fed this fourth pond, um, which unfortunately was never reconstructed after the 1935 flood. Um, and probably also in 1957, utilities closed the El Paso Canal, so that water source was no longer available um, for feeding, feeding the cascade that fed into the park. But you can see what, what a major amenity. And when I think about the fact that so many cities and towns are turning their creek sides into these major amenities, um, there have been a lot of articles in the paper about how our Chamber of Commerce and elected officials all went to Tulsa, Oklahoma to see this wonderful thing they did with the river that went through their town. And we had all of this, and we've turned our back on it, which is really sad. Um, one of the things that, that really also characterized the, the park in Palmer's Day were these wonderfully rustic bridges um, that crossed over the creek. And um, there's a, a, a man in Denver whom I just love who's a civil engineer, and he told me he had this, this moment of truth when he was a student at Dartmouth, and they were studying um, the bridges of Robert Merrill in, in Switzerland, which were built in the 19th century. And he said, if a bridge can be both beautiful and functional, then why aren't they always both? And um, this is an important bridge builder in the United States. And he said, in bridge design, the aesthetics are quite as important as the engineering detail. It's a crime to build an ugly bridge. And unfortunately, I think that's an ethic that we've forgotten today, because the bridges we see now over Monument Valley Park are nothing to write home about. This is another example of one of those rustic bridges. Um, on both, as you can see, they're on postcards. People were proud of them. And then another significant part uh, of Monument Valley Park is that Palmer was an early investor in Van Briggle's pottery, and when artists died in 1904, um, Palmer carved out a piece of what was to have been Monument Valley Park right there at Glen and Uinta and gave it to Ann Van Briggle to build a pottery. They had been down on Nevada, and it was in a residential neighborhood, and it was restricted. And so this was a much better place um, for the pottery. And so in 1907, Nicholas von den Arend was the architect and designed this incredible building uh, which is not now officially part of the park because it's owned by Colorado College, but um, certainly could be considered a key part of the park because it was an, originally in Palmer. It was Palmer's gift to Anne, and I th think it's certainly an asset. And one of the reasons, again, that it was built where it was is that people came in on the train immediately to the west of the building, and you'll notice if you walk by that building, that side, there's just lots and lots and lots of tile, and Van Briggle is repeated several times, so that people coming in would have seen it and would have wondered what's that wonderfully colorful building, and then would have been likely to walk back and perhaps purchase tiles. Um, these wonderful pavilions, two of them that are in the park, were designed by Thomas McLaren, who's Colorado Springs' leading architect. So they're significant for that reason, and plus they're quite beautiful. And then the first public pool in Colorado Springs was donated by the Penroses, and it was opened before 1920. Um, in the park, it's been closed for several years, unfortunately. And it's, I mean, it's one of the, one of, I think, only two, maybe three outdoor pools in the city. Um, and I think it's a, it, you can see the, the Pikes Peak and the mountains from the pool. It's really quite, quite wonderful. And the, these are, um, this is the bandstand that was donated, the funds by, by the Carlton family. Um, one of the things that I love is that the early superintendents of parks were all um, horticulturalists or plants people. They weren't functionaries or bureaucrats. And the one who was the, um, park superintendent from about 1920 to 1934 when he died was this wonderful man named Gustav Hennenhofer who was came from Germany. He'd apprenticed at Frederick the Great's castle at Sanssouci and really, really knew his horticulture. He actually was president of the American Rock Garden Association, and he had built this incredible rock garden down in the south end of Monument Valley Park. And in the newspaper, they say they brought 120 loads of rock from Palmer Park down to build this rock garden. And there are a lot of articles in the newspaper referring to this as one of the most popular tour sites in Colorado Springs, unfortunately also wiped out in the 1935 flood. So here are some of those historic photos of some of the activities that went on in the park. And you can see the, the skaters, the horseshoers, the, the kids playing with, with giant balls, et cetera, down by the by the pool and the pavilion. So it was, you know, really a central recreation area for the city. Uh -huh.